Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm sorry, but you're going to be really disappointed now with my presentation following that. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. Uh, I, I have to set this up a little bit, okay? So when I was putting this together, I was quite shocked to discover that there really isn't a lot of things, a lot of history documented about this radio station that was here in Princeton, uh, hence the title, Not Entirely Accurate. Uh, story of Princeton's radio station simply because part of it is going to have fact, there's going to be some rumors, and a whole lot of fiction. Okay? And, and that being said, uh, I want to warn you that the first 500 or so slides are going to be a little dry. Okay? So I will be reading a few of them. So uh, this is, uh, I have to set the story up. So in the beginning, this dates back to November of 1969, a fellow named John Skelly, on behalf of a company to be incorporated, was awarded a license for a new AM station in Kamloops. There's a reason for this. On the same day, the CRTC granted him a license to launch a radio station in Merritt. Now, the, the Merritt station would provide some local programming in Merritt, but would also broadcast uh, or rebroadcast some of the programming from the Kamloops station. And just to kind of make this not just all text on the screen, that was the uh, logo used for the radio station in Kamloops, Radio NL. And that is a look at the current studio in downtown Kamloops, uh, NL AM on the one side, and then they have an FM station on the other side. Uh, in 1970, uh, the Kamloops radio station, which had the call letters of CHNL, and the Merritt station, known as CJNL, both began broadcasting. Uh, the company that was incorporated was called NL Broadcasting Limited. I have no idea what the NL stood for. I have a suspicion it stood for nobody's listening. <laughs> because it was a small town radio station operation. Now, both of these stations uh, in uh, Merritt and uh, Kamloops were managed by John Skelly, and they provided full-time operation with uh, a lot of the Kamloops broadcasted, uh, or a lot of the Kamloops programming rebroadcast in Merritt. And that's the, the Merritt logo, Radio NL, nobody's listening. And that's uh, the current uh, studio in Merritt. Uh, the station flipped to FM. Uh, in recent years, and so now it's an FM station, which is quite current with uh, AM stations in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, province. Uh, in 1971, uh, John Skelly uh, then got the uh, okay to uh, establish a radio station in Princeton. And this is where our story starts. The new Princeton station would uh, rebroadcast programming from both Kamloops and Merritt, and the radio station in Princeton got the call letters of C-I-N-L. So all of them were called N-L, and they had a little mini network that they called Radio N-L. Again, nobody's listening. Now, I want to kind of talk a bit about radio networks in the 70s. So as I explained to you, uh, you had Kamloops, Merritt, and Princeton, the N-L radio network. In uh, the southern part of the province, you had CKOO and Oliver in Asuyus, CKGF in Grand Forks, CKSP in Summerland, and CKOK in Penticton. The, uh, the, uh, the first three I listed were rebroadcasters, and that was the Okanagan Radio Network. In uh, northern part of, or, or northern part of the Thompson Valley, uh, Salmon Arm was the mothership, if you will, and it had read broadcasters in uh, Revelstoke, Golden, and Invermere. You could see R, the letter R is at the end of each of their call letters, CKCR, CKGR, CKIR, and CKXR, and it was the big R network. And this was kind of common for uh, uh, a lot of these areas in BC. So this graphic just sort of gives you an idea of what a radio network would be like. So the, the red things would be your mothership, so CKOK Penticton, CHNL uh, or CJNL in Kamloops, and then all the feeds would be fed to these other little satellite stations. That gives you a bit of a visual of, of what a radio network was like. And so again, uh, just to give you a quick review, we had the Okanagan radio network in the southern part of the province, and then we had the big R radio network uh, that was in the Thompson area. And so, you know, Lots of networks were forming. This is back in the day where every small town had a radio station, and it was quite common for these, you know, they couldn't run on their own. They needed the help of a mothership, and so the, it was quite common to have these little radio networks everywhere. This is uh, just a, a thing that was in uh, a paper uh, in Penticton announcing uh, the formation of uh, 
uh, changing of, of uh, management of the Okanagan radio network. Uh, I don't expect you to read it. And here's another one. Um, a couple of these guys I actually worked for. Uh, Jeff, who's in the back of the room, who I used to work with back in Penticton. You'll recognize a couple of these guys. Uh, Ken Davis and Jerry Pash, uh, they were the guys who were uh, pretty much running the show in Penticton, and uh, they were uh, uh, quite uh, instrumental in keeping things flowing in the Okanagan radio network. So as I mentioned, there's local programming was a big deal with these little satellite stations. Eh? With the establishment of several mini networks dotting the AM dial in the interior came the need to provide local programming from studios in each community. And as a condition of licensing, many of these mini networks made such a commitment at time of license applications. So this is where you saw these little towns popping up with little studios. Revelstoke, Summerland, Asuyus, Princeton, all these little towns ended up with a little on-air studio, and that provided local programming uh, for their particular area. And it also fed the mothership with some local programming as well kind of gave it uh, a feel that there was some sort of connection in the community that these radio stations existed. So let's talk a little more about Princeton, okay? Because that's why you're here. You want to hear about the partially made up story about the Princeton radio station. Well, the on-air studio in Princeton was in the Sandman Inn on Highway 3. I can't prove that. I heard rumor of that. So right now it's on the screen, so it must be true. I've heard that also the night clerk who worked at the hotel often spent time working at the radio station as well. So that tells me that obviously the night clerk job was not really desirable. Again, I can't verify it, but it's on the screen, so it must be true. Now, the studio at the Sandman Inn was only there for a few years. It was eventually relocated in the 1980s to a second floor suite in the newly constructed BC Liquor Store building. Yeah, isn't that kind of cool? And it was uh, eventually, uh, in the early 2000s, a whole uh, stretch of uh, businesses on top of the liquor store got converted into uh, uh, apartments. So there's the Sandman Inn. I have no idea where the radio station was. If it was in there, I'm going to say, yeah, maybe there. Or maybe room 105. Who knows, right? So just guesswork. All right, so because it was a small satellite station, uh, there was a lot of equipment borrowed and begged and stolen from other radio stations, right? It was hand-me-downs, and the radio station ended up piece, piecing together a makeshift facility with all these borrowed pieces of equipment. The on-air broadcast console, or board as it was called by the radio people, in Princeton was a vintage 1953 Northern Electric R5420 broadcast console. That's the technical term for it. That's what it was named. That's how you would find it on Amazon if you're going to buy one of those things, if Amazon existed back in the early 70s. Now, the console used in Princeton did have history. It was used in Vancouver, and it was used in Merritt before it went to Princeton. And as I stated, about 95% of the on-air equipment in Princeton had been used somewhere else. That's the console. That's the board I'm talking about. I actually own that. It's uh, somewhere in my shed collecting dust and uh, is probably home to a couple of mice. But uh, that was the board that was used. In fact, it was on use, uh, in use here uh, the summer of 1986 when I came out and checked the place out. Uh, pretty simple. Um, other radio stations I've worked at had similar boards. You know, these are called pots, the, the knobs that you would turn, and they're all labeled so you can see what, you, what you're uh, operating. So turntable one, turntable two, uh, your microphone was there, uh, reel to reel tape one, the network feed was there. Uh, you could turn up the monitor gain so you, could, you know, if you were listening to what was going on in the studio, that was your volume there. And uh, there was even a switch to open the door, believe it or not, because if you're on air and somebody's buzzing you at the back door because they want a prize or they want to give you a free pizza, which did happen, or uh, you know, wanted to check you out or wanted to ask you out for a date or whatever the case may be, you know, they would hit a buzzer at the back door. And you know, you're playing music or you're reading the news or whatever, you can't drop what you're doing to run and open the back door because nine times out of ten, the door of the radio station is miles away from where you're sitting doing the broadcasting. So it was really easy. You would just kick the door switch and it would open the door. And you always hoped it was either a free pizza or a girl coming in to see you. That was basically what you were hoping for. It wasn't always the case. 
All right, back to uh, the fact that uh, most of the equipment at the radio station was borrowed uh, from trash heaps and on, uh, the on-air console did eventually get replaced. Believe it or not, there was hand-me-downs that helped you actually upgrade. The high-tech console that was used as a production board, now a production board is where you would be in a studio and you're making commercials. So it's not the on-air board, but it's a, an auxiliary board that's being used for other purposes in the, in the radio station. Uh, the one that was in the production studio at CKOK in Penticton got handed to uh, Princeton to use as their on-air board. So uh, try to ignore the fact that that's, uh, uh, you know, that's my evil twin. Uh, that's, that's seriously, that's me from 1983-ish. No, I don't. I have a brother, but uh, not a twin, yeah. Anyway, where was I going with this? Okay, so this is the production board here. Okay, so you can see, compared to the one that we had in Princeton, this is fairly high tech. Granted, even in the 80s, this was already outdated. But this is a production studio in Penticton where we would record uh, commercials and all sorts of, you know, do some live interviews or whatever. So this is me actually pretending to be doing that because this was a promotional still that was used at uh, uh, the radio station uh, uh, in Penticton, we had uh, all our on-air staff and everybody who worked at the radio station. There was a big uh, display case in the front as you entered the lobby in Penticton, and they had all our faces and and you know the Dymo tape labels. They would have our name underneath, and it would oh, so that's George. That's what he sounds like. Boy, he doesn't look like he sounds or whatever people would say, right? Anyway, that's the the console. And the the point I'm making is that was the console that moved to uh, to Princeton. Now, Princeton had a really interesting situation, too. It had a local owner. It wasn't entirely owned by the, uh, the people in Kamloops. Uh, the company that operated CINL was Princeton Broadcasting Limited. My checks said Princeton Broadcasting Limited. Uh, NL Broadcasting owned 51% uh, owned of the station, and Princeton's Lori Curry, which is a name some of you have probably heard already in your uh, time here, he had 49%. Curry also owned the Smilk Mean Spotlight newspaper in Princeton. And apparently, again, I can't verify this, but it's in the slide, so it's got to be true. He had two phones on his desk at the radio station. One was CINL, one was for the Spotlight. There was no bat phone, but he had two of these phones. Now, the ownership changed eventually at uh, the Princeton radio station. NL Broadcasting, again, NL stood for? You guys are paying attention. Uh, transferred all of their shares in the broadcasting interests of uh, the radio stations they had to a company called Fraser Valley Broadcasting. Remember I've told you about networks? Well, Fraser Valley had a network too, which include, uh, included the Chilliwack station and a repeater in Hope. The 51% share of the Princeton Broadcasting station shifted to Fraser Valley Broadcasting at that time. Now, there's a reason why I put this up here, the logo. These uh, two companies were kind of very closely knit with uh, directors and stuff. So the V's, uh, Fraser Valley and Okanagan Valley. That's what that stood for, which was kind of a cool logo, actually. I thought that was really kind of neat, and I wanted to share that with you. With the change to uh, the Fraser Valley, the call letters changed for the Princeton radio station. It uh, went from CINL to CKRP. Make whatever joke you want about that. It was kind of funny that I ended up working at a station called CKRP. People made a lot of fun of that. But uh, I wanted to end, uh, point out the call letter changes were typical when companies changed ownership of radio stations, whereas nowadays, if a radio station wants to change its brand, it'll change its call letters, and call letters get changed on a regular basis nowadays. The old CINL call letters that Princeton used to have uh, now sit on a unmanned satellite repeater in Ashcroft and Cache Creek. So there's the logo that we had, excuse me, we had at the time. Uh, and then there's another change in 1984. Like I said, the first 500 slides are a little, little dry, okay? We're getting to the fun part here. 
Uh, so in 1984, NL sold their uh, ownership of Princeton Broadcasting to Okanagan Radio Limited in Penticton. So here's where things start to speed up. And CKRP became part of the network of what was called Okanagan Radio, which included CKOO, uh, 1240, 1490 in Oliver and Asuyus, and CKSP, 1450 in Summerland. Don't ask me how I know those numbers. Just stuff that you remember from years and years and years of repeating that stuff on the air. Uh, so then CKRP ended up being a rebroadcaster of CKOK in Penticton. Now, getting staff in Princeton was challenging. Uh, there was a revolving door for staff. Employees came and went with regularity because it was a pretty tough job. Um, experienced broadcasters didn't stick around in a place like Princeton. There was not much there for them. Uh, so Princeton usually ended up being kind of a training ground for students who are fresh out of broadcasting school or local students who are interested in a, a radio career. As a result, it made the operation appear amateurish and unprofessional at times. Um, I'll give you a couple stories about that. Uh, there was uh, one person who shall remain nameless uh, who was working at the radio station when I was here, and uh, I would get the odd report somebody would phone me and say, well, you may want to check on what this person's saying on the radio because I don't know if they're saying things that they should be saying. And, and it's like, really? And I'm not going to turn on the radio and listen to it all day. I just spent most of the morning there doing my own thing. I wasn't going to listen to anyone else. So we had a system there. Yeah, I know, great manager, eh? Anyway, we had a system there where there was a tape recorder, a uh, cassette, and you could plug in a cassette and you could set it to record. And the engineer that we had at the time had it set so that every time the microphone went on, the tape would record. And when the microphone shut off, the tape would stop. So we would do that to record ourselves in the industry. It's called an air check. And you would want to do this every now and again and listen to your program, listen to yourself, see if you're getting better. I would do this every now and again just because I like to hear my voice sometimes, and sometimes I don't. But uh, I was listening to this one girl that was working at the radio station after I received a few calls. And I'm listening, and, you know, she's doing okay. She has zero experience in the business. And I'm thinking for someone who's off the street, she was doing quite well. That wasn't until she did a weather forecast, and she referred to it as pissing down rain. <laughs> I uh, had to correct her. I, uh, it was an interesting conversation. Same girl. And I have to censor the words. Same girl. Uh, I guess she wasn't paying attention. She had her headphones on and the microphone was on. Didn't realize she had the microphone on. And when the light bulb went on that she had the microphone on, it was like, oh, crap. And then it was like, oh, frick. I said, crap. Oh, crap. I said, frick. <laughs> and you can fill in the blanks as to what those words actually were. And yes, they went on the air. But nobody's listening, right? <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at what a day at the job was like, okay? So a normal day at the job at CKRP would start with the morning show. The morning show ran from 6 to 10. It included uh, collecting music from the library that was there. Uh, we had vinyl. We used vinyl right to the very last day, uh, but we also had CDs because that was an industry change. I remember Lori Curry making all sorts of noise, whining and complaining that he had to spend money on CD players because these little 45s wouldn't slip into a CD deck and play. <laughs> it just didn't make sense to him that, you know, an industry forced change, and it was like, well, we have to keep up, and we were nowhere close to keeping up. If you looked at the rest of the equipment we had there, we were like, in the dark ages. The Flintstones had a better radio station than we had when it came to equipment. But anyway, so you would collect, collect all your music, you would do your shift, and uh, you'd get a program log, which was uh, printed in Kamloops, eventually Penticton, and that laid out your schedule, so your commercials you would play and all the programming that you had to do that that hour, then the next hour, and the next hour, and that was all there. We had two local morning uh, newscasts and the content you'd have to actually collect yourself. So that meant uh, not going through the local newspaper, but actually going to events around town to gather information. After the morning show, uh, programming would, feed, would switch to your network feed. So that was either Kamloops or Penticton, depending on who owned the station at that time. And then the morning person would go out and sell ads. 
You would bang on doors and try to sell advertising for the radio station. And if you sold an ad, then you go back to the studio and you write that ad. And then you produce that ad and you produce the paperwork that uh, is going to eventually bill this client for that ad. Evenings, I mean, that's, you know, that took you till two or three in the afternoon. Evenings, you'd be at a town council meeting, school board meeting, some other meeting, because that's how you got your news for the next morning. So that was pretty much what it was like to work at the local radio station. This, uh, I put this in here just for fun. Uh, this is actually a letter I sent to someone from Sweden who thought they were listening to CKRP. Uh, they sent a tape. It turns out they weren't listening to us, and I had to nicely say, uh, no, um, where is it here? Uh, yeah, the reason why I say that, uh, or it said, thank you very much for your report. However, I do not think you were listening to CKRP. The reason why I say that is that Coca-Cola has never run commercials on CKRP or our station in Penticton. <laughs> there you go. All right, so as I said, a normal day of work at CKRP, you're looking 12 hours or more. No overtime pay. And like I said, it was a tough gig for someone straight out of broadcasting school. So a lot of people that came through our station and other small town stations, it's not unique to Princeton, would probably, after they did their stint, they would either uh, move back home, uh, change careers, um, you know, find something else to do. Because radio clearly was not for them if they couldn't put up with all this stuff, okay? As I said, it was mostly students. Uh, and uh, they would show up uh, out of broadcast school and they would do their practicum uh, time frame that they had to do and they were gone. Uh, and like I said, uh, experienced broadcasters had some familiarity with these kinds of working conditions and they would last a little longer but never long term like the guy who moved here in 1986. <laughs> this guy here, um, again, my evil twin, uh, came to Princeton in 1986 uh, after spending time in uh, the Okanagan. Uh, basically, this is my quick little story. I was at CKOK and CKOR in Penticton for five and a half years, and I did two and a half years before that at CKOV and CHIM FM in Kelowna. And the opportunity in Princeton to become the assistant manager came my way. Uh, I had spent the previous summer at CKRP helping someone uh, there who I eventually replaced and uh, after I was passed for a promotion in Penticton I had pretty much said that's it I need to move on. Uh, Lori Curry who owned the Princeton station at the time met me in Penticton. We had lunch and before I knew it I got hired. And so there we are CKRP. And that's uh, I don't know the date of that I'm gonna say 88, 89 but that's the studio in Princeton. Um, turntables. Remember that console I was telling you about in Penticton? Look where it is now. Uh, borrowed and sometimes pieced together uh, cart machines. Uh, this uh, con this uh, carousel where all our commercial carts uh, resided was probably borrowed or rebuilt or something from somewhere else. Reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Uh, a phone book just in case. Um, and, and a beautiful view of the parking lot. Uh, over top of the uh, liquor store. Uh, the coolest thing about working at this uh, radio station and having windows here and over here there were windows on this side of the building uh, was that I always knew when 10 o'clock was coming around because that was when traffic in the parking lot filled up for people to go into the liquor store when it opened. <laughs> I always knew that 10 o'clock must be close. Okay, so there's another look at that board, okay? A little, little reminder. And boom, there it is there. Okay, so hand-me-down equipment that uh, uh, cursed me through my career, followed me from Penticton to uh, here. Now, one of the things that we did a lot here in Princeton was on-location broadcasts. They were fun. I had so much fun doing that. Uh, in other stations I've worked, they would have a little mini uh, uh, a little mini studio, on-air st studio that they would take on wheels or something or a little trailer that they would take. Well, remote broadcasts in Princeton were not like that. We basically had a little mixing board, plugged in a microphone, ran it on a phone line, and we would do what we called cut-ins 
to the uh, the radio station. We'd have someone in the in the studio, and we would do little cut-ins. So that would be you know cutting into the regular hour of broadcasting and do a little interview with whoever we were on location with. So if it was a sponsor, you would do an interview with the sponsor. This is really kind of cool. One of the fun ones we did was the uh, grand opening of the early bird on Vermilion Avenue. This is now the location of the field store. So instead of cutting a ribbon, the owner, Ernie Lawrence, in his infinite wisdom, thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool to, you know, we're not going to cut a ribbon. We're going to do something else. We're going to cut a two by four. <laughs> Brilliant. So here we have uh, Mayor at the time, uh, Gloria Stout, and, and Lori Curry from the radio station. Uh, and they are trying to cut this board with this. And, uh, well, needless to say, this with a ribbon would have been a lot quicker. <laughs> I don't know that they ever finished this. Um, and, by the way, this doesn't translate very well on radio. I mean, I could just imagine doing the play-by-play. -play. And Gloria Stout has just pulled it back all the way, and she's going to now push it back towards Lori, and Curry is going to take a longer pull, and oh, no, he's just strained his elbow or whatever, right? <laughs> They're not going to cut through that board. I'm sorry. And now, motion, and now a word from our sponsor. Yeah. So needless to say, that was kind of an interesting scenario. And as I mentioned here, I talk about some of the uh, on-location broadcasts that we did. Uh, we did several over the years. Uh, one memorable one was the early bird one. Uh, another one that was fun was uh, Customer Appreciation Day at Mohawk. I'll tell you about that in a sec. And then we did the grand opening at uh, Dairy Queen, which was quite memorable because, get this, it was the first time we used cell phones for our on location. So, I mean, a lot of things were changing for us. And we did actually have cell phones at the radio station. They were flip phones, but they were still cell phones. So this is the uh, uh, Customer Appreciation at Mohawk. Um, my personal vehicle is sitting there with a CKRP magnet on the door because that was all the radio station could afford. Um, and anyway, we did this customer appreciation thing. And the coolest thing about this was we were drawing prizes uh, for stuff. I don't remember what. Probably, you know, free gas or something. And just so people would feel on the radio that they were part of it, I had the microphone. And I actually dumped it into the bucket and stirred the bucket with the microphone and it sucked everyone into the event, right? Because now you can hear this whatever sound and we would pull out a winner's name and it was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that one. That was, and, and the client, uh, Al Knowles, who had the Mohawk, was a, was a good friend of mine and he was a lot of fun to be around. We, uh, we just had a blast. It was a fun afternoon. That's the, uh, the Dairy Queen. As you can see, I've got uh, the uh, high-tech... Um, cell phone with me, so instead of a little mixing board and a microphone and having to do this, it's now talk, 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 hold the uh, cell phone, and get this, they actually cut a ribbon. <laughs> they didn't like throw ice cream or try to cut a, a dilly bar or something, they actually used a ribbon. So I think that was, that, that was a good thing. Uh, another thing that the assistant manager or morning announcer at the radio station had to do was be involved in the community. Todd kind of touched on that. Um, you know, so very, uh, you know, volunteering became a really important part of my life, and uh, I was involved with a lot of things. The Miss Princeton pageant, as it was known then, it's probably not a politically correct term now, uh, that was one of the things I was uh, involved in for quite some time. And uh, when I worked in different radio stations, when you did these things, you were expected to get something called a talent fee, which, you know, is, you know, 50 bucks for being here, 20 bucks for being there, whatever it was. That was not the case in Princeton. It was considered volunteer work. Um, you got, you were volunteered to do this. Uh, I have a, a funny story about uh, an on-location non-talent fee event that a, a, a fellow and I attended. Uh, this goes back in my time in Penticton, and, and Jeff will know part of the story, I think. Uh, there's an on-air guy I worked with named Kyle Anderson. And uh, the two of us were supposed to uh, introduce Doug and the Slugs. Doug and the Slugs were doing a, uh, a concert in Penticton. And so uh, we were supposed to introduce Doug and the Slugs. And the promoter had a ZZ Top car. You know, the car from their videos. Apparently it was supposed to be on site, which for some reason did not appear. 
and uh, he was giving away concert tickets to, uh, I think it was a concert for ZZ Top in Vancouver with hotel accommodations and food and blah, blah, blah. Nice big package of stuff. And so Kyle and I go and we are introduced to the promoter. And uh, the promoter explains to us that this is how this is going to go. And he hands me a ticket and he says, that's the ticket you're going to draw. <laughs> and it's like, really? <laughs> that's the ticket I'm going to draw. You know, we have a bucket. All these kids, it's kids, right? You know, I'm talking pre-teens and maybe some teens at this uh, concert. They're waiting to win this prize to go to Vancouver to see ZZ Top and take mom and dad to the hotel and stuff and all these other things that they had planned. But I have the winning ticket here, which I didn't have to think about. I know is not, there's no winner to this ticket, right? This guy's given me this ticket. It's a prize that's not going to be awarded. And I'm thinking, you sleazeball. So Kyle and I, we walk out to the stage, and, we, and we're both looking at each other, and I think we can read each other's minds. And Kyle says to me something along the lines of, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. What should we do? And we kind of chuckled about, why don't you just drop the ticket in the bucket and pick out another ticket, right? And I thought, you know, that would be the right thing to do to put this guy on the hook. But chances are he would end up, you know, hurting the winner. You know, I didn't want anyone's feelings to be hurt. And... It, I ended up drawing the ticket that he had given me. But that was my introduction to sleazy promoters. And in Princeton, I uh, had a couple of experiences with that as well. There was one guy that came in, uh, I can't remember when now, but one guy came in and he had a record he wanted me to play. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll listen to it after my shift and see if it's worthy of going on our playlist or whatever. And he says, no, 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 I want you to play it now. And it's like, well, no, I'm on the air. I'm like partway through my shift. He says, no, put it on the air, like stick it as your next song. And I said, I haven't even heard this. I need to audition it. I, I you know, I'm not going to do that. Well, he reached into his pocket, pulled out 20 bucks, and he says, here, I'll pay you 20 bucks if you play it. And I said, uh, I have to censor. I think I probably used the frick word uh, and probably the crap word a few times. And basically told him to get out and uh, and so he left and uh, he left his record and uh, as soon as I could see him out the window in the parking lot getting into his vehicle I took the 45 and it became a frisbee that went across the room and I do believe it actually stuck in the door <laughs> and never got played I, it eventually ended up in the garbage I don't remember the, the the label I don't remember the song I don't remember the group but uh, yeah, you know, you encounter that kind of stuff in small town radio. Back to Miss Princeton. So this is uh, one of the no talent fee of things that I did, and it was uh, uh, MC work. Um, you know, I, I was the master of ceremonies for a lot of different events around town. I usually joke around and say that it's part of my community service commitment, uh, you, know, you know, from the Federal Witness Protection Program. <laughs> and, and some people actually believe that. And if you do, uh, it's not true. Anyway, so that's uh, me doing one of these things. This next slide is kind of interesting because here I am. This is, uh, at, and don't ask me how I remember this stuff, just some of this stuff I remember. This is at um, uh, the high school, I think, but it was a lunch auction. Uh, all the candidates uh, for Miss Princeton that year made a lunch, and here I am doing a lunch auction. So this particular candidate is really kind of cool. I don't know if anyone recognizes her, but this is Barb Gould. Oh. Uh, she and I currently sit on Princeton Town Council. <laughs> and so this is Barb as a young girl uh, in high school uh, with uh, her lunch, which, by the way, was delicious. And uh, me doing the thing, uh, had no idea that... 20 some years later, we'd be working together on town council. But uh, I thought that was kind of a, a cool little story to share with you. Let's move on. Uh, as I said, you had to be a good corporate citizen as a radio station. CRTC expected you to do some stuff, and that included uh, supporting, uh, you know, all sorts of things uh, for Canadian cultural projects. One year, the radio station provided a television for the common area of Ridgewood Lodge. Another year, the radio station helped finance demo tapes for a local musical band to produce so that they would have something to take to record labels with hopes of receiving a recording contract. And there's, uh, there's Curry and I, Lori Curry, and my evil twin, 
and the Ridgewood Lodge TV. All right, so CKRP eventually changed its call letters. Uh, and this again uh, was uh, as a result of a, a, a sale of the company. Okanagan Skeena Group of Terrace took control of Okanagan Radio and uh, the buyout included the 51% interest in Princeton Broadcasting. And so in March of 1991, CKRP became CIOR, and the whole network changed call letters to the OR network, or the OR radio network, or OR, OR standing for Okanagan Radio, as opposed to NL, which stood for? Thank you. So there's the, uh, one of the OR radio logos that was used, all-time favorites was the branding they used. Now, kind of a funny story, I actually picked those call letters. When the OR set of call letters became the new branding for the stations in Penticton, Summerland, Oliver, Soyuz, and Princeton, CKOR was already chosen for the Penticton station. The other set of call letters were CHOR, CIOR, and CJOR. Uh, Lori Curry and I, we were uh, given the task to pick the ones we wanted. I ruled out the call letters C-J-O-R because in my mind those are considered heritage call letters from a station in Vancouver that I thought would be insulting if we had them on our station. So I didn't use, I didn't want those. And the C-H-O-R call uh, I didn't like because it spelt the word chore. <laughs> and I just didn't really like the way that came across. So we ended up with C-I-O-R, Curry and I agreed that that was the right choice. C-J-O-R ended up in a Soyuz where they still use it and C-H-O-R is in Summerland. Uh, now, one of the problems uh, with uh, being a satellite operation is the feed you end up getting uh, from your satellite uh, mothership. In 1994, uh, we started getting the signal from Summerland, and Curry and I, we made uh, an argument with the uh, head office in Pentic Penticton telling them that Advertising and information from Summerland made no sense in Princeton when you consider a lot of the traffic from Princeton would go to Penticton for shopping and things like that. And so a year later, uh, they decided that, uh, gee, maybe those guys in Princeton know what they're talking about, and they switched our feed. Uh, another commitment of a small town satellite repeater station uh, has with its network is new sharing. I've explained this a bit. Uh, each morning before 6, I'd be on the phone with the Penticton newsroom. They'd be looking for news items that were local to the Princeton area so they could use them later in the day, and it gave the network feed kind of a local feel. Uh, it also meant that I'd be voicing the odd short clip that would be inserted into a local story, and that was done with the other repeater stations too. So whoever was in the Summerland station would do that, whoever was in the Asuyu station would do that, and then it would make the Penticton station sound like they actually knew what was going on in, Penticton, er, in Princeton, Summerland, and all of our Asuyus. Uh, that's the new logo. They changed the logo again for some reason. I never liked that one. Just me. Um, now, there, there were some big stories that broke here, too. You know, Princeton being a small town, believe it or not, there are big stories. And I'm not talking sensational headline stories you see in local newspapers. And that's just my dig at local newspapers. Um, there were big stories that happened here. Uh, for example, the arrival of Rick Hansen and his Man in Motion tour was a big deal. Uh, things happened at town council were, were big news as well. Uh, but in November of 1995, the flood of the Tulamine River uh, stood out for me personally. Uh, I had been feeding stories to the Penticton news newsroom uh, that day, November 29th, and uh, I suggested that maybe we shut the feed off and do some regular programming from the Princeton studio to keep people up to date on what was going on, and the guys in Penticton said, no, we don't think it's a big enough story, or whatever the excuse they used was. And so um, after my, uh, my shift was done at 10, I actually killed the switch, uh, the feed from uh, Penticton, and started uh, doing local updates. And uh, we used the uh, Princeton radio station with uh, a member of town council, uh, Alderman Betty Pilon at that time. And we gave updates uh, throughout uh, the evening and right up to midnight that night. And uh, we had a lot of people tell us that uh, we had calmed them down. We uh, you know, settled their worries. Uh, we were giving them information that they needed to know, things like that, that they would, have, would not have had access to in any other way. And if there was ever an example that taught me the importance of local radio, that night was it. Leading up to it, 
everything was fun, everything after that was fun, but that particular evening, November 29th, 1995, totally stands out to me as the moment that I totally, the light bulb went on as to the importance of local radio. Sadly, uh, local radio is not like that anymore. It's, uh, you have big giant corporations that are taking them on and just, you know, homogenizing everything. Uh, there are other big stories I'd like to talk about. Uh, lots of floods. Um, uh, there was a flood that actually happened at the radio station on January 16, 1991. The uh, liquor store building's got a flat roof, and we had an early thaw that uh, January, and the down drain spouts were clogged up and water pooled on the roof and eventually worked its way into the radio station, which forced us off the air that day. Uh, just, it was in the papers, so there's a, you know, radio station falls victim to flooding. There's your basic sensationalized uh, news uh, headline there. And I could say that I owned a newspaper for a few years, so I know how important it is to do that, right? Oh my goodness, it's a victim of flooding, the radio station. What are we going to do? Of course, now nobody knows unless you lived in Princeton. It's a second story building, right? <laughs> so that must have been one hell of a flood, right? Until you realize milder temperatures over the weekend melted a lot of snow, collected over the winter, and sudden thaw caught many prints, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the radio station was forced to go off the air after the main floor of the building. Uh, it was flooded by uh, melting snow, poured into the building, and it went up, uh, went from there. So, yeah. Then there's other stories. Um, in September of 1991, uh, the town was experiencing a lot of break-ins. Uh, and the radio station got nailed. Uh, I was going in to work one morning, and uh, the door to the actual uh, radio station, there was a hallway, and there was four tenants in the hallway, so there was a common hallway, and the door from the hallway into the radio station had a window in it, and it had your basic little hole poked into it, and the door was ajar, and I knew this was not right. And I went in and uh, I found that the radio station had been broken into. Um, there were computers stolen. Uh, there were uh, a lot of things taken from, uh, from our uh, place. But the tenant next to us was uh, the local Okanagan College campus, which had 20-some computers in there, which were all gone. Uh, chiropractor's office uh, at the other end of the hall had uh, damage. Um, whatever these guys took, it took them time to do. And, uh, you know, for some reason, they, they got off with a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, here's a quick rundown of the story. So not just our area, but the bus depot got nailed. Uh, the chiropractic office, radio station, as I said. Thieves got their biggest haul from the radio station, taking two Sony brand compact disc players, a Sony cassette player, realistic police scanner, IBM computer, complete with keyboard, Panasonic printer, and approximately 40 CDs and a small amount of cash. And uh, we figured it was about 4,000 bucks they got away with. So back in 1991, that's, that's fairly significant. And um, it actually wasn't too bad. We actually uh, were able to limp along for a bit. But uh, because the broadcast, the, uh, the broadcast program logs that we printed off, uh, we would have, I think, three or four days in advance. So we actually had some stuff in reserve. But um, by the time we got to the end of that run, it was starting to, we were starting to feel the, uh, the, the break in. And uh, it, uh, it affected us uh, mentally as well. Uh, you know, you start looking over your shoulder and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm in the office, you know, when I was working there, I'd be pulling into the office at, um, when was I in there? I'd be in there at quarter to five in the morning, 4.30, quarter to five in the morning. And nine times out of 10, I'm the only person downtown. So, you know, you, 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 some of these things wear on you after a while. Then we had another interesting story. This goes to uh, May of 1998. Uh, it's not every day you, cat you encounter a Caterpillar 950F loader sitting in the middle of the main street downtown still running. What makes it even more interesting is uh, it was sitting outside the local bank and there's a hole in the wall where the ATM used to be. Yeah, so this story, RCMP got the call at quarter after four. I'm driving by there at 4.30 on my way to work. That's what I found. Yeah, it was, uh, talk about a news story in your lap, eh? So I had a hot story. Uh, ATM used to be there. 
So yeah, this was uh, quite the story. Now, a little bit of interesting trivia for you. The wall here, this particular tenant here, not at the time, but years later is where I actually ended up moving the Similkameen Newsleader newspaper I owned. And my computer desk was up against this wall backing the ATM. But not at that point, not at the time this happened. But uh, yeah, so that, uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, thing to wake up to in the morning. Um, yeah. Um, Think of that quite often, and Don Johnson uh, actually took that photo for her newspaper, so I, uh, I appreciate her letting me use that. Uh, Bill Miner Days was another event that came around in 1990. It was supposed to, uh, you know, set the world on fire, and it only attracted between 3,500 and 4,000 people, which was about half of what they were hoping for. And uh, I had actually uh, interviewed the organizers of that event uh, one morning. And uh, the local paper covered that, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Also, thunderstorms. How many here like thunderstorms? You're nuts. <laughs> oh, that's right, you're not in radio. Okay, I'll tell you, 24 years after my last shift uh, at the radio station, I still dislike thunderstorms. Usually when one passes through here, it would throw our transmitter off the air. Thunderstorms and radio do not mix. Now, when the transmitter was off the air, that usually meant to drive to the transmitter on Copper Mountain Road. Didn't matter what time of day or night it was. Sometimes I was there at five in the morning before the morning shift started, getting into the transmitter. In the winter, it was even more fun because I had to shovel my way in. So I'd shovel my way in, open the door, and there's a big giant humming machine. Well, not humming when the power is off, but it would normally hum. And there's basically a light switch you hit, and boom, it fires up and you're back on the air. Well, the engineer uh, we had at the time got really smart and created a remote system that you just had to pick up the phone, punch in four digits, and boom, you could go back on the air. And I could do this anywhere. I could be in Kelowna visiting my family, and somebody could tell me, hey, the station's off the air. Oh, no problem. Call up the transmitter, punch in the four-digit you know, code, boom, it's back on the air. It was great. And that was high tech at that time. Uh, this is just a, a, a radio station license, just so you have an idea what they look like. Uh, this is the legal document. This was actually for uh, a studio to transmit or link. So, you know, the, the uh, microwave things you would see on top of a radio station tower, which they probably don't do anymore. They probably do that all through uh, Wi-Fi or whatever. This would be what would send the signal either to the transmitter or from the transmitter to the, the studio. Here's the thing about minor, about, uh, minor days uh, having uh, absolutely no effect on uh, tourism. Uh, it was pretty sad here uh, in an interview with CKRP broadcaster. Uh, he, the guy said that the BC Day weekend was the reason why the event died. And I thought, yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I have my certain feelings about that particular event. And I think it was just, it was poorly managed. And they just, uh, I think they uh, just didn't really see uh, that uh, the potential they had was to maybe not do that here. Uh, interviews, we did a lot of interviews, as I said. Uh, they included uh, local politicians, advertisers, event coordinators, uh, nonprofit organizations, basically anybody with something to share, promote, or discuss of interest had time on the air. Uh, one particular event, or one particular interview I did was uh, with local pool staff which actually ended up in a water balloon fight in the studio. <laughs> I actually had a tip off and I was able to actually arm myself and defend a radio station and I think I won. <laughs> Pranks, radio, April Fool's Day and radio. How many people have heard April Fool's pranks on the radio? Really? Yeah, pretty common, right? I mean, this is, I mean, like, this is like a gift for a guy on the radio when April Fool's comes around. And so when I worked in Kelowna and Penticton, we did some elaborate stuff. Uh, in Kelowna, we did something about Ogopogo being captured once. And there was, in Penticton, we did some crazy things as well. So I brought that uh, spirit of fun to uh, Princeton. On April Fool's uh, one year, uh, I set up something called Princeton Today. And uh, what it was was, uh, I don't expect you to read that, but uh, what it was was I had announced that Lori Curry and myself were going to start Princeton's third weekly newspaper. We called it Princeton Today. 
Now, I had some lead time. What I did was I contacted our MLA, our MP, our mayor, uh, fire chief, a, a number of local dignitaries, and even some of our big corporate sponsors, and I got them all to record short little congratulatory notes. You know, like, hi, I'm Rod Carlson from Cal Tire in Princeton, congratulating George Elliott and Lori Curry on the start of their new business, Princeton Today. Call me, I want to advertise on it, or something like that, right? So I had all these kind of things, and I played it throughout that shift to make it sound legitimate. And then the local news, when it was time for me to do the local news broadcast in uh, that shift, the story was about the new newspaper. Now... I forgot to do one little detail. I forgot to tell Curry I was doing this. So he comes into the office, he's usually there, he would usually be there about seven o'clock and he'd sit in the studio during the 7.30 news just to hear what I'm doing on the news and we'd talk and share a coffee and whatever. Well, the 7.30 news that morning was about him and I starting Princeton's third news paper, uh, which he had never heard of at that point. And he's sitting there with a cup of coffee, and uh, well, needless to say, it was, um, I was glad that that shift eventually came to an end, <laughs> and that I could go home. <laughs> Curry was not, not amused. However, the phone calls we got, and the compliments we received on how carefully engineered this thing was, Curry th eventually warmed up to the idea and thought maybe it wasn't such a bad plan, so... But it was, it was kind of funny. And this uh, article actually ran in the News Leader, which uh, oddly enough is a newspaper I eventually bought and operated, but uh, the story was about us doing this and everybody had so much fun with, uh, with that prank. Another thing we did with the local radio station was support local causes. So that meant, uh, you know, giving discounted advertising to nonprofit organizations or a bunch of freebies and a lot of cross promotion. And we would encourage local businesses to do this. And so this is just an example of that where Realty World Hamilton and the radio station joined forces. Realty World paid for the advertising. We gave them free PR and we all worked together to help promote this particular event. So that was something that uh, we did quite often with small town radio. And then the local radio station came to an end. Uh, April 29, 1999, this was my last day on air here. Uh, Okanagan Skeena Group did not see CIOR as profitable and they decided to shut the local studio down. I knew about it uh, about a month or two beforehand. Uh, they gave me my walking papers the day before I expected it to happen and my 21 year broadcasting career came to an end. And there's an article in the paper about it. Um, they did a fairly nice job, uh, you know, with that particular story about uh, the end of local radio. I had no idea what they were going to do, but they eventually turned it into a, just a full-time repeater, and that's what it is still to this day. Uh, later that same day, the company got uh, bought by Telemedia, and uh, in 2002, Standard Radio bought uh, the company out. And this is about the time where radio stations just continue to get bought and sold, just like stock, right? Uh, 2007, Astro Media bought them. In 2014, uh, CRTC approved an application to convert uh, the Princeton station to a full-time repeater. 2014, which is funny because it was that in the 1999, my last day there, but they finally got around to doing the paperwork. And uh, so that was official as of 2014. Uh, and then in May of 2014, CRTC actually revoked the license uh, for broadcasting. So now it's just a full-time repeater. You'll probably never see a local radio station here ever again. Uh, that's just a little fun thing I did in the paper to promote something I was doing. Okay, so a little bit on me. Now that you've heard all about the radio station, let's talk about me. I thought I'd give AI a chance to explain who I am so I don't have to do all the talking. So this is what AI came up with. It says, George Eliot is a well-known Canadian author who was born in Princeton, British Columbia in 1946. Wrong. He's a member of the Okanagan Band in British Columbia. Wrong. And his writings often deal with indigenous experiences and cultural issues. Wrong. Eliot's most famous novel is The Divine Ryans, which was published in 1990. Wrong. And became a bestseller in Canada. How I wish. He's also written other novels, including A Song for Nettie Johnson and The Shining Mountains. Wrong and wrong. 
In addition to his work as a novelist, George Eliot is also a prolific playwright, wrong, and has written several plays including Digging Up the Mountains and The Unplugging, wrong and wrong. <laughs> Eliot has won numerous awards for his writing, including the Order of Canada <laughs> in 2016, sorry, that's also wrong, and the Governor General's Award for Fiction in 2000. And I just ran into chat GPT and I said, you know, do a biography on George Eliot in Princeton, BC, and that's what it's punched out so clearly as, don't use AI if you're looking for facts. Uh, here's uh, just a picture of, uh, of uh, Customer Appreciation Day. I wanted to kind of give Al a bit of PR for, uh, for being such a cool dude. Uh, CKRP on location, sandwich board sign there, and uh, the late Dean Stinson there doing uh, some promo. Uh, Al was very community-minded himself and did a lot of things for the community. Okay, so now for fun, let's do what, see what ChatGPT says about the radio station. You guys should know whether or not this is true or not. So the first radio station in Princeton was CKCQ, Wrong. which began broadcasting in 1955. The station was owned by the local newspaper, the Smilkameen Spotlight, Wrong. and initially operated on a fre frequency of 1230. CKCQ primarily played popular music and provided local news and information. Well, that's fairly close, yeah. In the 1970s, CKCQ changed ownership and became known as CKOR. Wrong. Wrong. The station continued to provide local news and music programming, but also began to incorporate more talk shows. Yeah, that's kind of okay. In the 1990s, CKOR was acquired by the Jim Patterson Broadcast Group, oh, wrong. wrong, which owns a number of radio and TV stations across Canada. The station's format changed to primarily adult contemporary, and it was rebranded as Sun FM, wrong. wrong. Yeah, yeah, go figure, eh? All righty, and that's it. Hey. You have learned the not entirely accurate story of Princeton's radio station. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I had uh, giving it to you. So you. have a great rest of your day. Thank you.